She's not here. She'll be here in a minute. Tiffany Kearney is here. Or Sylvia. Okay. And then. Oh, there she goes. Okay. We're here. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna we're not we're gonna have closed captioning be on a it's gonna be on another Zoom link, which is fine. You don't have to worry about any of that. Okay. So how are you? Okay, we're good. So the room's filling up. Is it? We got about 10 people. Okay. Um, and then I will manage the chat. And all I ask from you is when you're done with the slide, if you just say next slide, please. Absolutely. So just to give you a little idea of what this is going to look like, yep. um, we're doing a PowerPoint beginning. I'm going to dive a little bit into trauma and just how trauma affects women before they get to us. Um, so that PowerPoint is just really going to be impactful in that way. And then we're going to move away from the PowerPoint and it's just going to be me. Yeah. Perfect. We're going to go into a little bit more inspiration and hope. Okay. So, well, you just you just guide me, and I'll I'll listen to you. So, when you want to stop sharing screen, yeah, I'll just bring us all back together. Okay. And then, will I be able to see the people? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. So, what I'll do is when I stop sharing, Sylvia, it will be like a regular Zoom meeting. Okay. Give me just one minute. No problem. You scroll up to see okay. if Adrian's name is on the waiting room list. Um, no, it's not. Unless, nope, not yet. Okay. Sorry, I was on, I texted you yesterday. I was on the freeway. Yeah? I was on 205 coming back from Vancouver. Uh, on a motorcycle? Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I bought a motorcycle last year uh, with my first, well, the first stimulus check went towards it. And uh, I'm looking forward to riding this year. Riding by yourself? Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I ride with my husband. I don't ride my own bike, so. Yeah, I don't have a husband, so. So you have to get your own bike. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, we have about one minute. Let's breathe. You're going to be amazing. Thank you. We're proud of you. Thank you for joining us and being a presenter at Pure Apocalypse this year. We're honored to have you. Thank you. So we, excited. Yeah, we have about 16 people in um, in the waiting room right now. Um, okay, I am going to. Admit all. I'm going to do this. Hold on. And before we jump into the PowerPoint, let's just do an introduction. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And I'll and I'll do the yep. I'll yep. OK. <laughs> yep. And I'll I'll introduce you and I'll tell you to take it away. I'll do I'm going to be very brief. So I'm just going to do the hosting script talking about. Yes. And then oh God, you're kicking it off. Uh, we are. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. I'm going to enter people in. Wonderful. Terry, can you? My gosh, the room's filling up. Happy Monday and Pure Apocalypse Week. So great to see everybody. Um, we're just gonna give it a few minutes, you guys, and kind of let everybody, everybody get in that wants to be here and 
It's really great to see everybody. Happy Monday. All right, well, the room's filling up. All right, you guys, well, it's about 9.03, so I think we'll get started and I'll just keep admitting people as they come. So I just really want to, this is our first, uh, this is our first uh, workshop of the day for Peerpocalypse 2021, and I really just want to thank Sylvia for coming, and uh, I'm going to be really short. I'm just going to read some comfort agreements. Uh, uh, for the uh, for the workshop today. And so I want everybody to know that this workshop will be recorded. Um, so if you would rather be in call, please feel free to turn off your camera and change your name or remove your name from your um, from your screen. And it doesn't apply to this, but as you go through the conference, just so everybody knows that the breakout rooms will not be recorded, okay? Um, you may notice at the top of the screen that there's a red button that says live on Zoom with rev.com. Rev uh, we are, uh, this is the live uh, closed captioning service. So Peerpocalypse will have closed caption this year, which is super amazing and great. Um, it doesn't mean that we're live streaming anywhere publicly. Okay. Um, we ask that participants uh, on conference comfort agreements, and you can find that on page six of your conference program or listed on the Peerpocalypse website. Um, if time, anybody needs peer support throughout the conference, uh, please visit our website, www.peerpocalypse.com for a list of the on-call peer support specialists throughout the conference. Um, that participants keep themselves on mute. And if you have any questions or comments for the presen presenter, please use the chat box. And that's it from me. So uh, again, super cool and, and just happy to see everybody's face here today. And I'm gonna turn the floor over to Sylvia, our presenter. Thank you, Rena. And um... You know, thank you for your thank you for your apocalypse 2021 uh, for taking place and having this platform for us to get together and um, and learn and talk and um, anyhow so my name's Sylvia uh, you are in a forging a new path a woman recovering with hope resilience um, 
So I'd like to welcome the ladies and gentlemen that came. Um, the moment I opened my mouth, I got really nervous. I have a lot to say. Um, I also want you to, to have a heads up. I say, um, a lot and I stop and I look up to think. So I take pauses in between my sentences. I have prepared a lot. I probably am not forgetting what I'm about to say. Don't worry about me. It's just going to take a minute for the words to come out. So that's a precautionary. Uh, so what I want to do in this presentation is first, I want to kind of double down on what Brina said about comfort agreements. And one thing that I like to just be really open with is that if anything in my presentation triggers any emotions, um, feel free to breathe through them, uh, talk to me afterwards, talk to somebody um, and just keep an open mind. Uh, that's kind of weird as a presenter to say, but it's true. Um, we have the right to walk away from anything that makes us feel uncomfortable um, and keep boundaries to keep ourselves safe. Uh, I wanna acknowledge that all of us um, are in the field and have gone through a rough or interesting uh, or unique uh, set of months. Uh, and here we are continuing to grow as peers in our community. And that's something to be applauded. Just showing up, uh, signing up, going to work and doing what we do. Um, is an incredible feat. Um, our service to our community and to society is um, is undeniably making a difference. And so Welcome to Pure Apocalypse 2021. Um, okay, let's see. Um, where shall I start? I think I'm gonna start with saying that, um, now I forgot. I think I'm gonna start by saying that as mentors, um, we are uh, in a very unique, place in people's lives and our participants' lives. Um, we're not in a position like where counselors are, where they have a, like really rigid rules on how to uh, conduct themselves with peers. We're not probation officers. We're not uh, family members. We're not, we're not a lot of things. What we are are peers. And that it's a, a very unique role that we play. And I wanna point that out before I get into this PowerPoint because um, as peers, all of these systems that I'm about to show you and all of these circumstances and situations, um, we're invited in. We're invited in to walk people through situations. We're, uh, we're allowed in to, um, I'm sorry, we're invited in to be present and acknowledge people's reality. Um, and we're invited in to meet people where they're at. I think one of the things that was um, like my biggest aha moment as a mentor um, was realizing that I don't just mentor women like me, you know? I walked into the field and I wanted to mentor people the way that I had been mentored. Um, and I quickly realized that not everybody is me. Not everybody comes from my history, from my background, from my experiences. Not everybody's going to heal and recover the same way that I'm going to recover. And not everybody views the world in the same way that I view it. And it's very, very important when we are trying to develop a space to walk with people to really meet them where they're at. Um, so I'm gonna jump into this PowerPoint. I'm going to say, give me just one second. I'm going to say uh, PowerPoints are kind of, 
you know, so I made this one, it's pretty like bam, bam, bam information. Uh, and then we're going to get back to, um, my face and some more resilience and hope. But this PowerPoint is going to be a lot of information uh, and it's intended to be a lot of information. I think talking about women in recovery, you can go in so many different areas. When I, um, when I embarked on this presentation, there's just, there's just so much that you can talk about. Um, and I intentionally, um, I intentionally chose um, the material that I put in my PowerPoint, obviously, because I put it in my PowerPoint and it's there, you're about to see it, um, because it matches with what's going on today, right? We're going through a pandemic, we're going through social justice issues, we're going through uh, mental health by being at home, we're going through having masks on our faces, we're going through not having, um, connection, right? We're doing this via Zoom. And, and so that's kind of the way that I went. <laughs> Let's get into it. Okay, you ready for me? Okay. Um, give me one second, you guys. I want to make sure that this is as smooth for you as it is for me. Okay, next slide, please. Um, this is how one of my colleagues described me as a mentor. Um, wow, that's my face. <laughs> and they described me as a peer who's committed to supporting women and fighting for equity and meaningful representation, uh, aims to continue learning and growing and has demonstrated leadership in areas of equity in her years at Bridges to Change, which is where I work. Um, <laughs> to staying curious and asking critical questions and striving towards change, changing systems. Um, and I'm dedicated to peer support and recovery. So this is how uh, I would be identified at work apparently, which is pretty amazing. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I identify as a woman in recovery. Next slide, please. Oh, it's there, my bad. So this is the objective. The beginning is gonna be a little PowerPoint to you guys. The objective of this is to understand unique systems uh, that women navigate in recovery and how to better support women and mothers on the journey throughout um, throughout these in a trauma-informed, individualized approach. Um, next slide, please. So, very quickly, I want to take the men out of the conversation, but the men are part of a conversation when we talk about women in recovery and women in addiction. So I'm just gonna give a little bit about that. Um, substance use disorder progresses faster in women than it does in men. Um, there are fewer enzymes uh, in our stomach 
that um, break down alcohol. And we have more fatty tissue that slows down the process of alcohol and other drugs. And that causes our body to retain uh, substances for a longer period of time, which leaves us women exposed to that substance in our body for a longer period of time. Uh, that, ooh, my dog didn't like that. Uh, <laughs> that actually um, triggers some extra, I'm gonna pass that because I just got really nervous about saying that. Um, women enter treatment more compromised physically. Um, so the damage that drugs and alcohol do to women and men is different. Um, women come in with more health problems physically than men do even with the same amount of time uh, that they've been out in active addiction. Um, women are also considered relational substance users. Um, an example of that would be using with their partner, um, using their drug of choice, changing drugs of choice with their partners, um, using socially for the most part. There is this last point that said, um, when asked, 50% of women who injected heroin for the first time said that they did it with their partner and 90% of men answered that question. They said that they did it with their friends. So that just supports that women are a little dependent on men. Um, next slide, please. Oh, look, I had that point already on the last slide. So, Ooh, I just lost the nervousness. The nervousness just left. You guys, all of this information is going to come together and it's going to make so much sense. So just bear with me. So uh, when we ask women why they start using drugs or why they use drugs or why meth is part of their story, a lot of women say things like, I need to keep up with my kids. I need to clean my house. I have a job and I have responsibilities. I want to weight manage. My partner is involved with drugs. And so I want to hang out, like these are real reasons that women give when asked why they participate in using drugs, when these are not reasons that men will give for doing drugs, right? So just differences in differences. Um, and in the bottom, I also wanna say that this is, these are like research, things, um, and we know from lived experience and working in the field that there's, it's more complex and there's more complex issues that go along with substance use and um, why people use. So I just wanna acknowledge that. Next slide, please. So what's a system? Um, I have to, um, when I was looking at this presentation and I was thinking systems, systems, how am I gonna explain systems? What the heck is a system, right? I think it's uh, it's important to understand. Um, the top part of this is uh, the Google version of what a system is. Uh, it is an organized collection of parts that are highly integrated to accomplish an overall goal, which makes sense to me, right? I think of, um, how the food stamp office works. I think of how TriMet works. I think of how DHS works. I think of all the little people that are in there that work together to make it work. Um, but then my mind goes back to thinking, Oof, I'm on probation, I'm in the system now, right? That's being in a system. Um, the criminal justice system, the welfare system, the hospital and healthcare system, foster care system, probation and parole, drug court, treatment, school system, DNB, public transportation. These are all systems that we participate in, we have participated in, we have walked through, um, most of us, through some or all of those. Um, and as mentors, we're asked to uh, engage with our clients to walk through these systems. So I just wanted to clarify what the system is in 
my objective <laughs> to this PowerPoint. Next slide, please. And trauma informed care. Um, uh oh. One second. Sorry, guys. A little technical difficulty. So, uh, trauma informed care is an approach in human service field uh, that assumes that an individual is more likely than not to have a history of trauma. And trauma-informed care recognizes the presence of trauma symptoms and acknowledges the role trauma may play in an individual's life, including service staff. Trauma-informed care challenges provides challenges providers to stop asking what's wrong with you and begins asking what happened to you. I think. Um, I think it's really important to have an understanding of some of these definitions and uh, some, next slide, please. <laughs> it all can be other. So we're gonna um, we're gonna do some examples and some systems and some things that are happening in the world. So with the hospital and healthcare, um, African American women across all income spectrums, low income, medium income, high income, all walks of life, are dying from preventable pregnancy complications at a three or four times higher rate of non-Hispanic white women hospitals, systems. Death rates of black infants is twice of infants born to non-Hispanic white mothers. Twice. Uh, pain medication is sometimes not given as needed due to misinformation and old wives tales believe that some people in the healthcare field believe that black people have thicker skin and less nerve endings. In some states, if a DHS, if DHS has custody of your children and you go into labor and delivery, they will come and take your child from the hospital without any cause other than the fact that your child, your other children are already in DHS custody. So remember when I said that like some of the things that I'm going to say might make you want to take a deep breath. This is that slide, right? Like me saying that out loud makes me want to take a deep breath. And there's, whoa, Raina too. <laughs> and there's, um, there's a purpose for the reason that this slide is in there. And there's a purpose for the reason why it's so like that. And that is because it is purposefully challenging me and it's purposefully challenging other people that work in this field to acknowledge that our participants, our clients, people that we meet on our peers live through some of these experiences, right? This is their um, experience, right? And even though it feels really uncomfortable for me to acknowledge that, sometimes I need to go into that uncomfortable place um, and meet people where they're at, right? I think, um, like I said, it's all gonna come around, but I think that slide was very important uh, due to happening with my slides right now what happens no you can go you can skip this one you're good honey you're absolutely good it's all good uh, <laughs> 
Um, so, let me just reconnect with this real quick. Um, When I first came to the Pure Apocalypse, um, I was a mentor. I had only been a mentor for about four months. And I came with uh, my boss and some coworkers, and we had a table. And I went to these uh, groups and classes. And I had no idea what I was doing as a mentor. I mean, I had been in for like four months and I didn't even know what questions to ask, but I just remember coming in and being like, tell me what to do, right? And there's all of these little sessions that um, they were amazing and they were filled with knowledge and education. Um, and I just somehow wanted some people to answer some questions. And I really wanna make this an opportunity if anybody does have any questions, uh, to feel free to send them on into the chat. Um, I am absolutely available as well. Um, single parent households. So, Women, 83% uh, of single parents are women. Only 16% of single parents are men. Uh, mothers are doing two thirds of the caretaking of children and sometimes 100%. So getting them ready for school, getting them ready for bed, getting them in the bath, making sure that they have a snack, making sure that they're not on their tablets all day, making sure they're not eating dirt, making sure they're being breastfed, all of that, making sure that that bump doesn't need to go to the urgent care, all of that, two thirds to 100%. What? But okay. One out of four children is raised without a father. And women all around the world have perpetually been socialized to adhere to traditional gender roles that place the majority of child care upon them. What does that mean? Women are expected to take care of the kids. That's what that means. It's expected of us. Culturally, a mother's role is to always be available to her children. And without a father figure, mothers step into the primary breadwinner role. And what does that look like? Being a primary caretaker, two thirds, 100%. Being a primary breadwinner, that means working. How do you do that as a single parent? Um, so the mother's working statistic is 80% single mothers are employed. 50% of those are working full-time. 30% of those are working part-time. That leaves children in childcare or dependent on family of origin. I hope that the way that I'm is kind of showing how things just kind of add up, right? On our shoulders. So now like we're working and there's childcare and there's the cost of that. And then now there's a country, like there's the well-documented likelihood that a parent, a single parent, female household will be experiencing poverty. Next slide, please. Just a little more info. I think you should know about. Uh, <laughs> there's a gender gap uh, with pay, if you didn't know. Uh, typically, for every dollar a man makes, a woman makes less. It's not a secret. <laughs> it's well documented. And, um, and it's even more for women of color. So this is a little graph that shows um, 
what the wage gap was looking like in 2018. Uh, fortunately, about, um, I don't quite remember the number, I'm sorry, but states are making and putting laws into place and companies are changing policies in the way that they're hiring and um, change is happening, but this is real. And this is just another factor of how the system <laughs> and how hard it is to function and how unfair it is to function as a, a female <laughs> or a woman, right? So like I said, the all of this is just gonna be a lot of facts, bam, 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 a lot of trauma stuff. Next slide, please. Actually, wait, 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 wait a second. I, I mentioned the white women, right? Cause I'm a white woman, but let's look at the other numbers, right? Women of color, black women are making 62 cents to every dollar a white man makes. Hispanic women are making 54 cents to a what? A, what, what? That's like half, half. That's half y'all. All right. This is like real life statistics. I mean, anyways. Um, next slide, please. Yes, yeah, Sylvie, and I just want to acknowledge the chat and also you and just let you know that Terry and Annie and Maureen said you're doing a great job. So thank you. Thank you. And I will get to the next slide. What's in the chat? Just that you're doing an amazing job. Oh, thank God. <laughs> okay, next slide. Thank you. Oh, you guys, your kids are hungry. Kids are hungry. So giving you all this because my participants, they're women. They're women that have children. They come to me and they are, they're women that have children that want help that don't know what to do, <laughs> right? And so we kind of tackle all of these things and we tackle them backwards. And so I'm just kind of giving them to you forwards. Um, more than four out of 10 children live in households that struggle to meet basic need expenses. Seven to 11 million children live in households in which they are unable to eat enough because of the cost of food. Huh. With COVID-19 and remote learning, it's worse than the barriers. From school lunches to quality education for lower income children, and it has pushed their parents and particularly their mothers to choose between caregiving and employment. Last couple of years has been um, brutal <laughs> to uh, child hunger to, um, I don't have statistics, so I'll move on. Um, with the child hunger, when I talk about that, we can, we can do this one in a second. Just close your eyes, guys, so all the stuff. When I see this slide, I automatically think, what do you do when you're hungry? You go and you steal some food, maybe, right? You go and you do what you have to do to survive, right? And so I see a cycle of perpetuating like, huh, survival mode in this. Next slide, please. I think I want to acknowledge the men because I found this and I, um, my eyes opened up a little, right? So um, for um, me, I tend to acknowledge that, uh, you know, sexual trauma brought me and a, a lot of people that I know into a place of um, our disease. Let me put it that way. Um, and so like digging into that um, with kind of like the Me Too movement 
in that space right there, I find that I connect a lot with women um, without being like, hey, so were you like hurt as a child? Like, that's not my tagline. Uh, but like acknowledging that and <laughs> um, acknowledging that has actually uh, really opened up uh, some barriers uh, to connecting with people, right? We'll get to that. Um, I just want to acknowledge that 81% um, of women report sexual and or physical abuse before the age of 18. So this graph is interesting, right? It says that 19% of women were lucky enough to not like experience physical trauma, sexual trauma growing up, not victimized. Um, but 81% of women experience something, physical abuse, sexual abuse, or physical and sexual abuse. And I wanted to add the, I wanted to add the men into this um, because 69% of men also reported sexual and physical abuse. And 31% of them reported not being victimized at all. And when I look at that, I think, what time is it? Oh, good. Okay. When I look at that, I think, um, dang, like those aren't just my participants. Those aren't just my peers, but those are just my people. Like these are people in the world. Like I tread lightly with compassion <laughs> when I look at statistics like this. Um, and I acknowledge the men as well, because I don't think that I, I just, you know, I just, I get to, this is my platform today. Next slide. Um, that was actually, uh, that graph in itself is, um, That graph in itself is a lot. Um, I wanna to get to this cute little car with the heart, but that graph in itself is a lot. And um, we will circle back around to how the depth of emotions in a lot of this is a tool that we use to connect with people. These deep breaths and these moments of uncertainty in this presentation is just because this is a lot and I'm very uncertain of how it's coming across. But when I put this together, like I know what I'm talking about because I do this every day with compassion and truth and resilience and hope. <laughs> so um, I'm just gonna carry on. I had to say that to get my courage back. So we get these people, right? We get these people, they somehow come to us, somehow, right? They, they come to us. Most of the time they get in our cars, we pick them up somewhere, right? And we get to talk for a while. This is how it used to be. Uh, I don't know how it is now for many people. So I'm not gonna guess how y'all do your job right now, but we're just gonna go with how. We can imagine, pick him up. Hi, my name's Sylvia. <laughs> I'm your mentor. <laughs> so they get in their car with all these broken dreams, right? Like these women that like had dreams of like marriage and financial security and like a, a family unit and like good happy stuff, right? And all of a sudden they're in my Toyota Camry that like eh, me, eh, and they're asking me how to, how, how, to how to help them fix their life. Like they are not happy. Mm. Okay, I, I did, I, I backtracked, I back. We're in a good place. They're, they're with me now, they're safe. <laughs> I'm safe, car's a safe space. Um, but what I'm saying is like, you. <laughs> As a mentor, I look at it as you, you, I. 
and there's a very like mentory like staffy way to say this like I uh I'm there for the participant to like guide them through their journey, but I'm going to say this the way that I would talk in normal conversation. So I get this person, right? And this person's broken and desperate for something. And some of the times they don't believe me that like I can be there for them or that this is going to work or whoever referred them to whatever this is like, mm -mm, right? And so there's, This moment where trust has to happen. Um, I'm gonna just read my slide. I think I just, I just, I'm just gonna read my slide. Um, so after all the broken dreams and trauma and sexual assault, after all the biases from people in the world and broken relationships, after poverty, hunger, pain, they finally meet me, usually in my car. Next slide. I went on a little twirl on that one. Y'all, this is recorded. Sylvia, I'm gonna, can I just acknowledge the chat for a minute? Absolutely. Okay, so Marissa has a question. Is the presenter going to provide sources for her data? Thanks. Yes. Okay, thank you. And then also a, a chat from Ashley. Did the graph represent only men and women experiencing violence? No, only men and women under 18. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Yes, under 18. <laughs> That's sorry the whole that. point. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Thank you, Ashley. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah. So what I typically, okay, so thank goodness we're getting to the end of the PowerPoint. Okay. Mm. This, is, this, this is good, you guys. We're going to do this. Doing great, Sylvia. Thank you so much. Absolutely, girl. Ooh. Um. So sometimes there isn't that barrier, right? And sometimes there's a participant that is ready and willing and, you know, available, uh, not available, that's the wrong word. Uh, so typically, um, not typically, but sometimes, typically, I wrote typically for a reason, typically. <laughs> I hear something that will fit into the um, guilt and shame, uh, with trauma growing up, violence in the family, poverty, sexual assault, um, being a caretaker for siblings or parents or family members um, that the person did not fit in or they were picked on or they were not popular. Um, they got into the relationship with the wrong guy. Um, they were in the wrong crowd. Pregnancy, body image issues, had uh, to support a child. And usually it's, I don't want my child to see me this way. Um, and sometimes it's nothing like that. Sometimes it's, I'm a soccer mom and I've been drinking quietly <laughs> and it wasn't a problem until it became a problem and now I'm here. <laughs> so, um, but normally, not normally, um, but, but what I hear a lot is the guilt and shame and that I don't trust women. Right, initially. Oh, hi, Terry. Next slide. So, how do you build trust? So, you let yourself be seen, you become, you are authentic, vulnerable, you listen, you allow for self efficacy. And self-efficacy is when your client articulates what she wants and she believes that she can get it and you know your own story. Um, next slide. Thank you. 
Um, we can actually take this down. Hi, everybody. So as mentors, we already have trust in our communities, right? Like we got hired on into this job where the people that interviewed us see something in us that we already have. Like we have uh, an authentic way to connect with people. We have the ability to navigate systems and services already. We have recovery. We have the ability to connect with people. Uh, we have what they want already. That's why we're here, right? First step. Second step. We, and the, I, we are given this amazing gift of peer support, right? Peer support mentoring where we're not tied to anything other than our participant. Um, This is where my sponsor told me to take a breath and be myself and be real. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, I can do this. Um, okay. So a question that um, I have be, I began asking myself in um, later mentorship is who do I work for, right? Um, I think it's a really important question while mentoring. Um, I made the mistake in the beginning um, of kind of blurring lines for myself personally. Um, wait, who am I? Let me, let me give you a rundown. Who am I? My name is Sylvia. I was born in Europe. English is my second language. Um, I immigrated here. Um, let's see, I mean, and the story is for a reason as well. Gosh, I need to really pull this together then so it makes sense. I hope I can do that. Um, <laughs> um, I'm a survivor of sexual assault. I picked up drugs when I was 15. I started using intravenously when I was 18. Uh, meth was my drug of choice for a long time. Uh, I met a person. Uh, Heroin was his drug of choice. I changed drugs of choices. Um, I had endocarditis, which did not stop me from using. I lost a child in labor and delivery at one point in uh, active addiction. That did not stop me from using. And at one point, uh, yes. And at one point, um, I was at a trap house and I realized that um, this was gonna be my life forever if I didn't do something to change it. I wasn't gonna die, obviously. <laughs> uh, it was just gonna keep going and going and going. And I didn't know what to do. Um, and I think that for me was my moment of uh, realizing that I was an addict. And that was like kind of my gift to myself to realize that addicts go to treatment, right? Like <laughs> that makes sense. Um, for me, I went to treatment, uh, I went to inpatient treatment, I moved into clean and sober living, uh, and I worked a couple of jobs, then I became a mentor, and here I am, right? So that is my real short condensed story that I tell clients sometimes, like the baby part's iffy. <laughs> um, I don't usually, like drugs of choice are iffy too, right? uh about whether you say the name or not like it's controversial um but that's it like i say things that will connect with people so that they can have something to say me too about because most of the time they will um and what are the barriers that are holding us back right from connecting a lot of the barriers are self-imposed a lot of the barriers are barriers that are put on us by Ooh, let me say it. By um, 
Oh, I'm going to say it. A lot of times the barriers are put on us by supervisors that just don't know what we're doing in the field quite yet. And what we need to do is we need to communicate with them and advocate for our clients so that we can provide the services that we need to provide. So here's where we get all inspirational and stuff, you guys. Okay. So we went through all the trauma of our clients and that's a really important piece. All that downer information, all the graphs, all the yuck is really important because that's life. That's life on life's terms. And it's not our life right now, but it was at some point. Right. And it's important to remember that because when we walk into a situation, like we're walking in with recovery and we're walking in with spirituality and we're walking in with like, Oh, it's Monday. And they're walking in with one foot in the yuck and one foot in the, can we do this? What is this? I can't have this. I, the, I've got all this stuff holding me back. Like I have to co-parent with somebody that's loaded and I'm in the system. And we are that tool that tells them that they do not have to be grounded in systems forever. They do not have to be participants of DHS forever. They do not have to be participants of probation and parole forever. They do not have to be participants of our programs forever. We, mentors, women, men, anybody supporting anybody, get to have a voice and get to reach them where they're at. So today I showed up looking like this uh, because I'm talking to you guys, right? Um, when I meet with my mentees, I typically don't have makeup on. Um, I don't wear brandy things. Like the most brandy thing I have is my purse, uh, but that's it. Like I don't suit up and like shine on with my mentees personally. Um, I don't want anybody to feel the need to have to, that costs money, right? And I don't want to put any pressure on a woman to have to dress up, right? That's just me. That's just me. I don't wear makeup. I don't, I don't do that with my people. Um, <clears throat> but we're in COVID, so never mind. Um, I did a little twirl. Um, empowering women is a really tricky thing, right? Because they come in and they don't trust women. Don't trust women. A lot of times their mom didn't protect them. Their sister stole their man. And I know these are really like generalized, like stereotypes, but like truth, right? Like truth. The DHS worker took the kids, lied about the stuff in court. And who am I? Who is this girl that says she's gonna be there for me? How we build trust is we show up when we say we're gonna show up. We do what we say we're gonna do. If we say we're gonna bring a loaf of bread to the barbecue, we bring a loaf of bread to the barbecue because we do what we say we're gonna do. It's important to not cancel appointments. It's important to not, it's important to be present. It's important to not, okay, not be on your phone, not check your schedule, not like be on Facebook, all that stuff, right? When you're present with a, a participant, um, that builds trust. Bring the loaf of bread. Always bring the loaf of bread. Just remember, if you say you're going to do something, do it. <laughs> that builds trust significantly. Um, okay. I'm just looking at time. Yeah, I'm going to just the chat really quick. Just have a couple of shout outs for you. Marissa just wants to say that you're doing great. And she really appreciates uh, your authenticity and your bravery. Yeah. Yeah. And, you. and then we have one more from Julia. Thank you, Sylvia, for sharing your story. You're doing a wonderful job presenting. And then we have one more here. Uh, Christina says, just this morning, I had a client text me stating she wants out of a 
this domestic violence situation. Mm -hmm. Ron stating they work things out. It is a scary place to be with someone when they're still in DV. I was wondering how to be more authentic to hold a safe place with the person and then empower her. This is very, this is a very important topic. Thank you for bringing it to Peer Apocalypse. Mm. Um, what I heard is you were asking for feedback. Yes. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. So it sounds like a feedback. Yeah. Yeah. So I think just to kind of sum it up of just because it's a, uh, I heard it. I totally okay. heard it. Yeah. Perfect. I heard it. Um, be a safe space. Don't be somebody, don't make plans for people. Don't tell people how to live their life. Um, people are the expert in their own lives and they will do what they need to do. They will go through their own process, especially in processes like this that are dangerous and hard to leave. Um, the fact that somebody has reached out to you has already told you that they consider you a safe person, that they already consider you an ally, and that they already consider you somebody that they will reach out to you when they're ready. Um, the only thing that like a little red flag to me is as a mentor is, um, you know, are there children involved and are those kids safe? That's the only thing that would cross my mind. Um, as you know, as a professional. Um, but other than that, um, and then also, um, I would talk to my supervisor about it. A hundred percent reach out to your supervisor and be like, Hey, this is what's happening. Right. Have candid conver. Okay. Let's talk about <laughs> candid conversations with your team. <laughs> um, I think also knowing, um, I mean, if we're going to get deep into domestic violence process, I think also knowing um, what an exit plan looks like, what an exit plan strategy looks like for women in danger, um, knowing your community resources, uh, knowing where safe shelters are, and um, building community relationships with women that run those programs. Um, and when she's ready, if it is as, uh, if it's like, if it's a real, like she needs to like, and hide, um, you will already have knowledge and resources of like where she can go. And like, you can help support her in making that plan. And you can be like, okay, I will call so-and-so and then so-and-so will make this happen. Um, that's what I would do. Um, And I would tell her she's worthy of more. I would tell her she's worthy of more. We get to empower each other today. No matter what that looks like. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, my biggest thing is always not always talk to your supervisor because you're not doing a good job. Um, I always talk to my supervisor because I like talking to my supervisor um, <laughs> and because I'm not always right and I, not, I don't always have the best idea and I'm not always looking at a situation with the right perspective. Uh, sometimes I'm emotionally attached to a perspective in a way that uh, isn't good for the situation. And sometimes I just don't have enough experience or knowledge, or maybe they have more. So I, that's just what I tend to do. Um, I think that's a really good habit. Um, I think with the remainder of my time, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about um, teamwork <laughs> and uh, so, okay. Women, barriers and uh, gosh, I forgot what it's called. Systems, women barriers and systems. So um, us women uh, have many barriers and um, walk through many systems. 
in our lifetime and we'll continue to walk through many systems. Um, we will continue to um, fight <laughs> and overcome many barriers. I think the point of this presentation is really to um, empower and to raise a voice to say that there are women, you guys, me guys, all guys and men who, um, who are out here collectively giving a crap, <laughs> right? We're out here making a difference and um, let me get working on it. Um, helping walk women who are struggling with barriers and systems, help them walk through and navigate these systems um, in a way that's efficient for them. <sighs> yeah, I think I covered my objective. <laughs> um, so what I do know really well is, um, is community and the feeling of tribe is incredibly important to all of us, I think. Um, I think uh, self-image and self-worth and self-esteem and self-care and spiritual, personal, emotional health and financial health and uh, smoking. <laughs> Uh, so I have this list of things, right? Like I wrote this list uh, and I just read it out loud and um, that happened. Um, okay. Uh, I think it's really important that um, let me take a second. Uh -oh. You're forging the path, girl. You're doing great. Okay. You're doing amazing. Um, okay. So I have, I'm going to say I have 20 minutes. So here's, here's what I do, you guys. I, um, I started working at Bridges to Change and I had no idea what I was doing as a mentor. I just, um, I was working at a plumbing company and I was like, I'm spending 40 hours a week in a warehouse. Like where does my higher power want me in this, right? And so somehow I wound up at Bridges to Change as a mentor. Um, my journey at Bridges to Change has been a lot with um, the equity and inclus inclusion committee. Um, I'm into a lot of DEI work. I um, found my passion in um, advocating, uh, in fighting for people's rights, in opening my own blinders, right? And like my little heart, like just jumps for joy, right? <laughs> to be able to say that, like when I became a mentor, like I had no idea how to, um, I had no idea how to do this. Right. And it took time. It took experience. Um, and it took the help of this community. Like, uh, I have, um, you know, I have found my voice at working with Bridges Change and being a mentor. Um, for me, I don't know why I keep seeing bridges to change. I should probably stop that. <laughs> um, but that's where I work. Um, and it's an incredible feeling to find a voice you know, like you never knew you had, right? And we get to take, I get to take that and look at women that I'm helping. And I'm just like, I get, to help you get out of um I think I'm I think I think I'm done. <laughs> I think I lost everything I needed to say. Um in closing um 
in closing, what I'm going to say is I challenge everybody to uh, meet people where they're at. It's one of the most challenging things in life, in everyday life, is to meet people where they're at. Um, to listen to them, to listen to their story and listen to the small details that tell you where they're at, right? And meet them there and listen to what they want and give them that. Give them services that they're requesting. Um, for me, and my job, I ask myself very often, who do I work for? And it's not the company that I work for. I work for the person that's in front of me. I'm their person. I'm not my boss's person. I'm not their PO's person. I'm not their DHS case's person. I'm their person. So I'm there to help them deal with all those other people. Um, and I also look at real stuff. Like, how are you dealing? How are you dealing with your mental health? How are you dealing with your physical health? How are you dealing? How are you dealing? You know? Not how how are you like not using drugs or how are you like with your probation officer? Or how is your treatment going or how is your needs assessment plan going? Or how is your treatment plan going? Or how are your goals that we set for you going? Mm -mm. How are you? Where do we go from here? Um, my biggest mistake as a mentor has been definitely not remembering who I work for, working for others, rather than the person that is in front of me. Um, having a, my own personal agenda um, like I need to get this, this, and this, and this done. Uh, utilizing their time for my needs, like looking at my calendar for the next participant or answering calls from my teammates or answering personal calls while I'm with the person that's in front of me that it's their time. Like I'm not present. Um, those are my mistakes, you know? And in those moments, <sighs> And those moments is where I get to show up. And in those moments is where I get to build authenticity. It's where I get to build real life relationships. And it's where I get an opportunity to either plant a seed or do whatever it is that the universe wants done in that moment, right? I honestly have no idea what the hell I said today. I hit you all with a lot of statistics that I think are really important. I think it's really important to acknowledge our black and brown community. I think it's really important to acknowledge that, they're, that they and we are suffering right now. I think it's really important to acknowledge mental health right now, mental health crisis of all of us. I think it's important to acknowledge that it's been a rough year. <laughs> I think it's important to acknowledge that people suffer from childhood abuse. I think it's important to acknowledge that children are hungry. I think it's important to acknowledge that people live in poverty and that COVID made it worse. I think it's important to acknowledge that I would much rather see you all in person and not do this because I can't even feel no energy, right? I just, I just, I'm just looking at Kim. <laughs> um, forging a path forward in mentoring changes every, what's the time? 10, good, good, good. Forging a path in mentorship uh, continues to change, right? The way that I mentored three years ago isn't the, the way that I'm mentoring now. Um, no. And I have to be aware and flexible and open to change. I have to be willing to accept that the way that I recovered isn't going to be the way that somebody else recovers and that's okay. I have to be willing and able to meet people where they're at with what they're doing gracefully and non-judgmentally and love them just as they are because Honestly, look at all the yuck that I showed you. I might be the first person that loves them in a long time. 
that's powerful. Because who, I mean, what? The PO is not going to give him a hug. <laughs> Show up. Show up. And don't take this job home. Um, I think it's awesome. I mean, showing up and being 100% present or 90% present or 80% present for your participants and giving them the woof and the power and the resilience and the everything is incredibly important. It's also incredibly important to step back and turn your phone off and go home. And also when somebody leaves your program unexpectedly or doesn't do what you think they should do or fails or whatever, does something, right? Like it's not personal. You didn't do anything wrong. You wouldn't have been a better mentor if you did something else. You just get to like continue working. <laughs> um, I just, I think that's really important. Um, and just keep advocating for your clients, you guys, um, with everybody, with everybody. Like your boss, your boss's boss, your the POs, everybody. Like, I don't know. Sylvia, can I just uh, acknowledge the chat for a minute? Yep. Okay. So from Ashley, Sylvia is so much braver than most women and men I know. You got this, Sylvia. <laughs> Carolyn, what an amazing way to kick off your pocket lips 2021. I appreciate you, Sylvia, Raina, and Terry, and all the wonderful women and men in this room. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Chantel, thanks for speaking from your heart. Anita, Sylvia, you are very much appreciated. This presentation was off the chain. You are awesome. Thank you, guys. And that's, that's like, thank you. Like, that's exactly what I needed to hear. Um, you got, that's, thank you for mentoring me. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for uh, fueling me and seeing that that's exactly what I needed. You guys are right on and I appreciate that. Um, this was hard, <laughs> but um, but whatever, man, it's done. <laughs> um, we're just, we're living in an incredible time and um, use your voice and use your power because you were in a position of power. You were in a position of power and you have a voice and you've earned it and you get to use it for other people. And that is so powerful. <sighs> Check your mental health, make sure you're eating and drinking water. <laughs> I love you guys. Uh, thank you. I love you, Sylvia. You did great, honey. Thanks, Gina. Thank you, Sylvia. <laughs> Bye, you guys. Bye, Rena. You did a great job, too. Yes, thank you, Rena. Absolutely. Absolutely. Enjoy the conference. Sylvia, you rocked it. Thank you. Good job. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. And it's over. Woohoo! Over. <laughs> Sylvia, I sent you a friend request. Did you? Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for all your help with this. You did. <laughs> you did amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I tried really hard to not be really like social justice-y like too hard, right? That's, <laughs> that's where my passion is. That's where I live. Um, but I, you know, that's where I live. Great. You did great. Thank you so much. I kick off the morning and the conference. So I'm 
grateful that I got to be a part of your presentation. Can I say one more thing, please? Oh, yes. Yeah. So Sylvia, I really appreciate at the very beginning of your presentation talking about your your see that right there. I do the exact same thing when I have to pause and then I always look up and I'm really looking for words, looking for thoughts. And oftentimes people just talk right over that. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciate you saying that out loud. And then for me to see it mirrored, it's like, oh my goodness, look how, how amazing this woman is in her presentation. And at the same time, taking that, taking your pauses to pull the words together thoughtfully. So thank you. You're welcome, Amy. We get to take our space. Thank you so much. Okay. Are we good? We're good. We're good. Thanks, guys. Have a wonderful Pure Apocalypse. You too.